This program is powered by the virtual dot show, making your offline events virtual. Ladies and gentlemen, the host of Web at Virtual, Dr. Plamen Rusev. Hello and welcome, wonderful Webit community. Welcome to another program of Webit Virtual, the Global Thought Leadership Network. Thank you so much for joining us again from all around the world, and I hope you're great. Today is a special day. It's the day of the Labor Day. I think that our community is, uh, has something in common. We celebrate the Labor Day every day and working at the same time while enjoying life and making people's lives better. So let's celebrate this day together. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to having a truly inspirational and very informational discussion with our top of the league journalists who we've invited today to this live program to discuss information and disinformation in this COVID times. I can't wait to hear the opinions of these fantastic journalists. And here they are. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm presenting you Sprika, who is executive editor of Business Insider. Sprika Srivastava. How are you, Sprika? Elizabeth Breer is an assistant editor reporter at Forbes. Welcome. Lawrence Lee is a multiple award-winning foreign correspondent, and he has worked at Al Jazeera since 2008. Hello, Lawrence. Great having you. Hello. And Ru Abbas Kermani is a news anchor, writer, producer with 12 years experience in broadcast journalism currently with BBC. Thanks. Here they are, their business, business cards. <clears throat> Let's see. The executive editor of Business Insider, leading the London newsroom overseeing tech, market, finance and retail coverage. Prior to joining Business Insider, Spricka was the deputy digital news editor for CNBC International and one of the moderators for the Global Markets Forum at Thomson Reuters. Lawrence Lee is a senior correspondent for Al Jazeera English since 2008. Before that, he worked at Sky News and the BBC for 20 years. Lawrence is a multiple award-winning foreign correspondent. As one of the channel's most high-profile correspondent, he has reported on a range of issues. Elizabeth Breyer is an assistant editor and reporter at Forbes. She covers top innovators and disruptive technologies. She also tracks the fortunes of the world's richest. Prior to arriving at Forbes, Elizabeth was a reporter at the Huffington Post and Tech Day HQ. Ru Abbas Kermani is a news anchor at BBC Voice, writer and producer with 12 years experience in broadcast journalism. She has worked for premier global broadcasters including the BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, Channel 4 News and most recently at France 24 presenting and writing hourly live news bulletins. Thank you for joining us. Such such a pleasure. How are you? Good, thank you. All, all things considered, quite good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so having, like... having the, in mind the situation, it must be good if we're all healthy, safe, and smiling. Absolutely. I would like to start our discussion now. We all heard how amazing you are. I don't need to say a word anymore, uh, but uh, I would like to, to hear and to see the beauty of your minds. And I would like to ask you to share openly your real reflection on the current situation. And we are going to be discussing what is the information and the disinformation in the time that we live in? It will be challenging, I'm sure, and I count on your honesty, uh, which I don't, I don't uh, question at all. I usually say I'm the symbol of pronoia, meaning that I do believe in the global conspiracy of the good of the humankind. 
But still, there are so many questions to be asked. And there are so many answers to be searched. And the first one is actually, what is really going on? How much of this information do we see now? And I would like to, to invite first Priha to, to tell us her point of view of the situation. Thank you, Dr. Rousseff. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, for a journalist, I think it's, it's always a challenging situation, especially when you have so much information and um, so much, um, you know, sort of information being thrown at you, really, to be able to differentiate between what's right and what's, what's wrong. Um, for me, in my 12 years of being a journalist, um, I've had two basic things, two tenets of journalism, which is fact, um, fact checking, so accuracy and speed. Um, you can be very fast to report news, but if you don't know if it's not accurate, then you're essentially losing your credibility as not just a journalist, but also the organization that you work for. In the current situation that we are in, um, and, you know, given the fact that we have social media, which is absolutely, which is great, which is, it's really good that we have social media, but then it also poses a really big challenge for us as a journalist, um, especially in times of breaking news when you're thrown um, lots and lots of information at you through through Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. How do you decide what to act on? How do you chase a fast uh, moving piece of news that every other organization is probably starting to lead with, um, and but you're not absolutely sure on how to go about it? Um, from, from my perspective and the team that I manage, we make sure that we um, check everything. We, we do fact check. I think my team, my um, uh, colleagues will probably agree with me on this um, there is a certain specific uh, you know section um, set of uh, rules that you follow um, just to make sure that what you're reporting is not wrong or is not, not considered for others um, and in, in trying to do that you make sure that first of all so, so if it's on Twitter you make sure that the profile is verified it's coming from a, a verified source you uh, you you know there are other things that you do like you call and make sure that you double source or double confirm the information that you've received um and only when you're able to do all of that that you know you're ready to get the story out um and uh, i think i'm probably going to stop here and let my colleagues uh, also give their point of view but in my opinion uh, as a journalist it's 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 very exciting it's a very challenging time but it's also heavy responsibility that we have on our shoulders right now to be able to differentiate between what's right and what's wrong Uh, I, I have a, a suggestion for all of you because I, you're journalists. You can speak for hours and it will be so interesting for everyone. Let's play the game. <laughs> and the game will be no more than two minutes answer. Are you ready to play that game? Absolutely. There are a lot of questions for you and there will be questions from the audience. Hashtag Webit on Twitter. You can ask any question to all our participants in the studio. Use Twitter for all your questions to these amazing journalists. And there is a question, the same question now for, for Elizabeth, and then Rue, if you may, and Lawrence, your overall uh, picture of what is going on now, and then we go deep into, into the discussion. Liz? Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so it's a very interesting time to be working. In We're obviously not on the front lines of this the way that our amazing healthcare workers are, but we are navigating what the World Health Organization in early February described as an infodemic. Um, they describe this as an overabundance of information, some true, some not that's making it really difficult for people to find reliable sources and um, trustworthy guidance. And as this has continued to spread and reach you know, a pandemic level in mid-March, this amount of information has only increased as it's touched every single industry directly and indirectly. Um, and there's a real hunger for this information. This is a really major event. And the fact that there's really not much to do, um, People are really seeking this out. Um, and I think as journalists, it's our responsibility to provide the absolute best information we can, given the fact that there's so much uncertainty and we're learning right along with the scientists. 
Um, and I think for me, the bigger challenge rather than disinformation is the spread of misinformation. Um, like stories about coronavirus coming from 5G towers or escaping a lab in Wuhan just aren't, you know, stories we would publish. I think more of the challenge is stories that are reported accurately, but end up ultimately being wrong, the lack of text or critique, simply out of date. Um, I think a prominent example of this was early on, it was shown that we should be putting people on ventilators as early as possible, a lot sooner than with other respiratory illnesses. Um, but that was as late as last week, shown that the guidance is now to put people on later. So reporting that was done two months ago was accurate, um, but is now wrong. So this is a new disease. We're learning right along with the scientists again. And I think the challenge is reiterating this uncertainty to readers, um, but being very forthcoming about it. Um, that's a way for them to have trust in us and what we're doing. Thank you so much, Liz. We failed with the game, but we're still going to catch up with that, and uh, we're going to make it. Uh, Laurence and Ru, Ru, could you please uh, reflect on this? Yes, I, I, I agree with a lot of what Elizabeth's saying. I mean, arguably, the COVID-19 pandemic is the biggest news story of our time. And as journalists, it's our job to inform the public of the facts, accurate facts, and hold truth to power. However, we do find ourselves in uncharted territory um, with the coverage of this pandemic because mainly uh, we don't know much about the disease and um, the scientists, the politicians, the, the, they're also learning and we're sort of, as, uh, uh, for, for us as journalists, we're informing them of that process and what might be true, what, for instance, the advice on masks. Um, initially, you know, yeah. the, there is so much co uh, sort of conflicting lines coming in all the time. No one can decide whether the masks are, uh, are worth using or not. And um, in the same way, I think uh, as this story is like continuing to evolve, so are the facts. And uh, the government are telling us that we are in a war-like situation. But I, I would say that there is also a sort of um, information war uh, going on because, uh, as uh, Elizabeth said earlier, that there are the conspiracy theories which are also also spreading like wildfire. And um, I think that since the advent of social media, people have started sort of um, there's a kind of confirmation bias with um, the echo chambers that they prescribe to on their news feeds. And I think that because of that, it has made um, our jobs quite difficult. And um, also, um, there is a, a great deal of challenge. I think it's very challenging also to appear credible um, when the news lines change. And you know, people, I think the audiences follow us, uh, follow different news outlets. Um, and uh, a lot of the time, I, I and myself have read things which, um, you know, one particular publication, for instance, will go against, and then the next week they're pro. So. It's, 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 these are challenging times and it's, you know, we also have to maintain the trust of our audience at the same time, our readers, our viewers. And um, uh, another, I work in broadcast media and the greatest challenge is um, that we have to act fast in the facts that we give to the public. And um, especially because, you know, there is the pressure to break news. And I think that, um, you know, every day the lines are constantly evolving. It's a very interesting time in journalism. I, I would I would say that everything that you say is uh, definite. It's, it's, but think about if you, the journalist, have issues finding the information and the source of information and the true information, how the rest of the humankind feels. Journalists are known for for their critical thinking. They know they know how to check information, how to trace information, and. You share now that you have these challenges, uh, Lawrence. I will I will come back to you just for for wrapping up this first part of the show, and then we go deep for the questions that are going back to numbers and to, to real statistics about the information and disinformation and who is who and why. But please let us understand your reflection on the on the current challenges. Uh, 
Uh, I don't hear you, Lawrence. I'm not sure Sorry. if you're muted. Are you, uh, can, can, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. No, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, no, I, th I think Elizabeth got it absolutely bang on. It's to, to be just briefly, the, the, there's obviously a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation might be malign, or it might just be because people are misunderstanding things. And clearly, in a situation where even scientists, because it's a novel virus, even scientists are saying conflict. Um, I lost you again. Ah, uh, Lawrence. We wait for you to fix your microphone in the studio. In your studio. No, you mute. Sorry, you muted me. Um, no, the, no, it's fine. No, it's perfect. Yeah. So, so in a situation where even the scientists can't quite no. understand. <laughs> um, Is somebody happened? from the studio imposed on you a mute? Oh my God! I can't. I can't believe that uh, this is going on now, live. Sorry, Lawrence. That's okay. Um, yeah. So, so misinformation might be malign, and it might be accidental. Clearly, things about rubbish about five G masks and all that uh, is, is is a conspiracy. But disinformation is much more sinister because clearly it's political, uh, and by its nature has malign intent. And you know everything from you know Trump bl blaming the Chinese to all these wacky conspiracies that are emerging out of Eastern Europe about the whole thing being a Western uh, plot and Bill Gates and George Soros being involved. Uh, that is that is directly political. Um, now, uh, the, the, the good thing about disinformation is that so much of it is absolutely way off the scale rubbish that it's actually easy to dismiss it. And in some ways, I think misinformation and misunderstandings of it are much more difficult for journalists because so much of the conflicting evidence all seems to be credible and wading through it and finding out what's right and wrong is really hard, uh, particularly when scientists keep seeing the change change their minds about what they know. So telling the public in that sense becomes very difficult. What, what we saw is uh, the numbers. The numbers were staggering. The big data analysis is, uh, is something that we were doing and they were they were terrible i've been sharing numbers and numbers and numbers since january uh and and they look terrible but then we decided to to step back reflect and there was another big pandemia and there were over 500,000 deaths a little bit more than 10 years ago but no one was locked down nothing really happened in that time now the whole world is locked down and that's very interesting so my question for you and all of you please feel free to to answer now without a specific order we are now in discussions do you really have your own way and i please share your own way of finding the information that you are looking for or you're always finding conflicting information and you cannot really choose which one is the true one what is the problem with uh, sweden is there a problem are there number two in that uh, row or they are not or so what about finding information sources how does it work for you and this will help everyone who listens to maybe search for information sources um something that i found was interesting that i think speaks to that uh, last week, there was a preprint that came out of Stanford University and the University of Southern California. Um, and in the audience, no, a preprint in academic publishing is a scholarly or scientific work that hasn't yet been peer reviewed. Um, so this particular one was, you know, all over social media, was making its way in some mainstream news sources. And basically, it was saying that California can might see 80 times the amount of coronavirus cases than they previously believed based on these antibody tests. Um, and again, this was proliferating around, you know, mainstream sources. And we at Forbes in particular are very wary of these preprints. Again, they haven't been peer reviewed, but because of the traction that was getting, we decided to it, um, but include all of the criticism that it was also getting from the scientific community you know, questioning its methodology, um, how it was recruiting participants, and um, just the effectiveness of these antibody tests. So I, at a certain point, it's okay to report these figures, but if you, including the criticism and providing that context, 
um, I think is really important. We don't need to coddle audiences. I think they're actually developing an acceptance for the uncertainty and notions that things can change. There are outside voices and that science is a process. And even, even, even on the, 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 the absolutely central issue of when's there going to be a vaccine or is there going to be a vaccine, you know, you, you, you hear scientists in, in, in my country, I heard within the space of two or three days last week, uh, a leading scientist from Imperial College, which is doing vaccine tests at the moment, saying, look, this is a pretty straightforward virus. We don't think it's going to be very difficult to get a vaccine. And then a, another leading scientist turns up on the television a couple of days later saying the thing about coronavirus is, is we don't have a very good track record. We haven't got a cure for yeah. cold, which is a coronavirus. We might not get a vaccine at all. And, and I've ended up, and, and I mean, you'd never normally hear me say this, I've ended up actually being feeling very sorry for politicians <laughs> because, you know, they, 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 they keep having to say they're being guided by the science, but the science is, is, is shifting and evolving. And I, I, I'm getting a bit fed up, to be honest, with a lot of journalists in this country going at politicians all the time saying, you didn't go into lockdown early enough, you should have done this and you should have done that. And, you know, blaming politicians when all the politicians are trying to do actually is, is act upon the best science they're being given. You know, but the, the science a month ago here, the mass testing was a bad idea. Now they're starting mass testing because they changed their mind based on the experience of South Korea and, and, and those countries where they've had some successes. I, I, I don't think you can legitimately blame politicians for, and, and I don't think the public actually blame the politicians. They, they're, they're okay in this country with the politicians and they're fed up with the journalists. Uh, and I'm and I, um, frankly on the public side on this because it is, I've, when I'm doing broadcast now, I'm not even trying to second guess what, what, what the science says because it's a moving mm. target. I think it's a really no? difficult... Oh, sorry. 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 No, I was just saying, I think it's, these are unprecedented times. We've not seen anything like this before. At least I haven't seen in my lifetime. Um, and it makes it very challenging. You're for still very young, Sprika. Sorry to say this, but... Uh... <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but these are very unprecedented times. And for us to be able to, and for journalists, it's even more challenging because we are the carrier of news. So for us to be able yeah. to publish something, we need to understand that ourselves first. And we are given very little time to be able to do that, to get up to speed with everything that's been going on. Um, and, and I think I agree with Elizabeth when she says that a lot of times we are constantly being very skeptical with what's coming our way. We are constantly questioning things and content and um, you know adding methodology to it is probably the key in terms of getting information out. So we still have to get information out to our readers. We still have to be responsible for that, but make sure we caveat it with the fact that it's all evolving. So, you know, we are not... We are not somebody who knows exactly what's going on. We are constantly questioning it and changing yeah. along with the evolving uh, landscape. Ultimately, uh, absolutely, think, Ruh, Yeah, please. Ultimately, journalists rely on their sources, and in this case, the sources are unreliable. <laughs> so, because they're changing their minds every day, and uh, the journalists and the government are relying on the science. So, uh, it's a bit of a vicious circle at the moment. But I think that. Um, with time, as uh, we learn more about the disease, we'll, we'll get there. But I think at, at this stage, that is the greatest challenge, that our sources are just not reliable. So uh, currently, we have 6,000 people with us, and they ask themselves a question. And I cannot help but ask you that question. Let's talk about global conspiracy now. How much of, of your... Uh, media is guided by censorship. I know you cannot say, but let's let's talk about media. Do you think that there is some level of censorship being imposed to media? And can you guess by whom? Well, for me, it's it's the, 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 one of the things I think you've seen with this. You know, I, I, at the start of this, everybody and I kept saying, everybody kept saying to me. There's got to be a silver lining. You know, is the world going to come out of this in a nice place and we're going to stop bombing each other and all that sort of thing? In, in a way, it's sort of the opposite of that. What, what you've seen is these countries, which you sort of expected them to take, take its opportunity to entrench what they were trying to do before. So, I mean, even in the European Union, you know, the, the, the best example is Hungary, um, which has now decided to suspend democracy uh, completely for the time being. And the Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, has got executive control over everything. Um, and you know that's the kind of thing that and, and frankly a bit of a lame response uh from the european union too as well 
So it's it, you know it's 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 a sort of entrenching of of, of what you thought you were going to get. But in one of the ways is, is in some ways is, is is the most depressing aspect of this and the politicization of it all. You know, I mean, in America, obviously Trump's going at China now as a, as a election campaign tactic. Um, and, and, and you sort of, well, once you see it happening, you kind of think, well, that was bound to happen, wasn't it? It would just be nice if it was a bit different. You guys have something about here. Uh, yes, I was just I was going to add to what Lawrence is saying earlier. Um, I I think this whole uh, situation has brought out a totally different uh, sort of. Uh, you start to see the nature of the countries uh, from emerging markets to more developed markets as well. Um, in the U.S., definitely, as uh, Lawrence mentioned, this is going to be. I mean, Trump has been after for a long time now with all the US-China trade deal, um, you know, constantly. And this whole thing has brought out a new picture, to new picture, a new reality, rather, that the voters are probably trying to understand that Trump is the only one who can give China a tough time. Um, and that might bring him back into the office for the second term. For the emerging market countries, you do see that, um, you know, they are stepping up. Some of the countries are genuinely stepping up uh, to, take, uh, to, you know, uh, to measure the impact of COVID-19. Um, Again, this is an area that because nobody really knows and it's never really happened, it's still evolving. But in terms of media censorship, I I mean, I don't really see anything from my part. I mean, we are investigating, we are constantly um, questioning things, but maybe uh, everybody is still trying to understand what's really going on. And if you don't really know a, a particular aspect, you don't really know how things are moving, how can you actually question? I, I would argue as well that there's no censorship as such, but I think there is um, there is a, uh, a style of coverage which um, has become quite pronounced for me anyway. Uh, for instance, over here, I'm in the United Kingdom, and the death toll is set. We're, we're on course to be to have the highest death toll in all of Europe, but um, the way that uh, it's being reported nationally, I would argue, is quite different to how we were seeing coverage of uh, Italy which was near next to sort of almost appearing apocalyptic. And while we're, while we're in the UK, I, I haven't seen, I mean, I think that there is a slight sensitivity to the way that the stories are being covered because um, <clears throat> there is a kind of, um, I would say, um, skepticism and a negative view that yes. some people have had about our, what we do. So I think that uh, there is a sensitivity there in the way that... Um, but do you yeah. think that's because people have got used to it, Rue, a bit? The, the... When Italy happened, everyone was like, whoa, that's massive. But after a few weeks, you sort of get used to six, seven, eight hundred people every day dying. Yeah, by the time it comes over here, you're sort of, you, you know, you're a bit inured to it somehow, aren't you? Yeah, but I haven't seen much coverage. For instance, um, Sky did, uh, uh, Stuart Ramsey went into hospital in uh, Bergamo and he did a, yeah. a brilliant report. I mm. haven't seen anything that is sort of on par with that with the NHS here and, and I haven't seen any sort of um, perhaps I've missed it but I haven't I've been I have been following everything as much as I can but there were a couple of very good pieces on the, to be fair uh, Fergus Walsh um, did, did, did one and somebody else did one as well from inside the, the ICUs they had they have been there you, yeah, you, you, you have on, on BBC sorry. on BBC you had uh, someone who has been um, also in our studio uh, in your seats now not, not in your home though but <laughs> in the virtual <laughs> studio uh, and uh, this was Professor uh, Ciccone. Professor Ciccone is the European uh, um, Association or Council of, uh, of Emergency Care President, and he is the head of emergency uh, can care uh, unit of the most, uh, the toughest place in, in Tuscany. Um, maybe he sold the most of the deaths. He was in the studio and he made us almost cry because he said something that was very, very true, that he had to learn how to smile with his eye because the mask is on the face and that he's so honored of a society that puts the human's lives before the economy. That became kind of a, kind of a you know, guiding line of, of yeah. all our uh, programs. We had Vint Cerf last week here. Vint has been through uh, the COVID himself. He was infected, he was sick with COVID-19, he was sharing his story. He actually made it quite public in US, not that much around the world, but uh, the father of internet being infected and being alive, thanks God now, going through it, it's been a story. So there are real stories, but 
I think I think I think the media problem, to to, to be honest with you, um, I, th I think the media problem is is more in countries where before this started uh, there was a bit of a democratic deficit anyway, and the media was in a, a fairly morbid situation to begin with, and had a lot there was a lot of state control in, in Central Eastern Europe, for example. There's there's a extraordinary story that emerged in North the North Macedonia the other day, a conspiracy theory that said the virus was planned in 2012 during the London Olympics when, when, when during the opening ceremony, Rue, you'll remember, there were people were bouncing up and down on the, on the beds as a celebration of the NHS. In North Macedonia, that became a, a story that said that the West was planning a pandemic and this was the trigger for it to start in 2012 during the London Olympics opening ceremony. And that story then started to circulate and mutated like the mm, virus. Like in the virus. Like <laughs> Serbia and Hungary uh, where it then turned into a story that said Bill Gates was trying to uh, had start, had started the pandemic because he wanted Microsoft to have overall control of surveillance. Are you spreading this information now, <laughs> Morrison? What I'm, I'm, are you doing? I'm, I'm not. I'm <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> drunk, drunk. You know, all, all the all the gin in the world. It, that became a news story on a Hungarian website, and this is what I'm trying to tell you: is is in countries where you've got a problem with the media to start with because it's not free in now in countries like Hungary, then anti-Western stories like this can proliferate really yeah. easily uh, because, because there's nobody to stop them. I think in, in countries where you have a much freer media, and I would still include the UK in that, as, as, as Rue said, there's not really a problem with censorship at all, to be honest with you. I also think there is this whole coronavirus fatigue setting in now uh, in terms of uh, in terms of news and um, in, in, that might be true for a lot of things that you've mentioned, Lawrence, that um, when a lot of these stories are now turning into conspiracy theory stories just because um, people don't really have the interest to go back and read the usual um, stories that, you know, that, that are fact based uh, in terms of the number of deaths, the number of infections, um, where it's going ahead from here. And you actually exactly. see that on a regular basis that there is fatigue setting in, um, mm. which is sort of leading to more conspiracy theory um, led stories. I, mean, I, I, I think I would like to request uh, your, uh, your attention just for one second, because I haven't heard from Liz for a while. Uh, Liz. Yeah, well, I was going to say uh, in the U.S. there's, you know, we haven't seen censorship really with the media, but what we, of course, have seen living in an extremely polarized political climate, um, the spread, like I was saying before, of misinformation with news being heavily politicized. Um, from the beginning, President Trump has been really minimizing the deadliness of this virus in the U.S., you know, starting with him saying it was a democratic hoax and then you know, more recently in the past couple of weeks, kind of hanging on to this 60,000 number as the likely death toll in the U.S. Um, and there's a few problems with that. One, we've, we've passed that, I think, either yesterday or the day before that number has been passed. But before that even happened, that number was flawed and was based on a projection model that was showing deaths through August. Um, so, of course, that wasn't accounting for you know, a potential second wave. Um, and also that model was variable and was very easily subject to change based on new data. But, you know, him holding on to that, like, low 60,000 numbers, obviously a political move to show, you know, we're doing okay in this country. So again, context is super important when reporting these numbers. And as hard as it is trying to look past political biases. Um, Liz, you have been uh, working quite deeply with. Uh, I mean, you, you're you're in technology, as we've heard from your from your uh, bio. You're you're committed to to the technology, to innovation, etc. But you have been digging deeper in um, in the COVID uh, for the past few months. Not that everyone else doesn't, but you too. So um, let's say if we say there's no censorship, it's good. It means freedom of media, which is great. If we don't speak about uh, some whatever rumors come from whatever places in the world, but freedom of media is there. Now the question is, where did this information come from? And how can we make the difference between information and disinformation at some healthy level? I mean, there is nothing absolute, uh, uh, perfect, but healthy level. 
Yeah, again, disinformation for my platform, and I'm assuming, you know, the platform for my other panelists is really less of a problem. Like we wouldn't publish, you know, these conspiracy theories again, 5G towers causing coronavirus. We might point to it as an interesting story that's going around, but we're not going to report on it in a serious way. Again, the problem is these stories that are done accurately, um, but ultimately end up being wrong. Um, something that sticks out for me is in the beginning, I think like late February, we had a story with about 4 million views talking about why you didn't need to wear masks. Obviously, the CDC guidance has since changed, and that story is still, I will see it shared, you know, wildly, um, and it's, it's wrong now. So I think it's the responsibility to, you know, A, post a counter to that with the new guidance, and then also go back and be like, we've learned something new, um, and this is what the new guidance is, and really trying to instill in our audience um, that science is a process. We're okay. learning just as the scientists are um, and to kind of bear with us. Yeah, I think those sorts of, uh, there are discrepancies, for instance, with the death toll as well. I mean, the government's mm -hmm. claims here in the UK that we're reaching about 27,000 deaths. But uh, there was a report in the Financial Times last week which uh, projected it to be over 40,000 because um, of the way that uh, the information is logged, administ uh, administration, administrative procedures um, due to which there, are, there is a lag. And also, um, if we're, we're talking about, like, in a way, the, the politics of how the information is related to the public, if you say it's 27,000, it doesn't sound as severe as 40,000, but these are all based on projections and the accuracy will emerge with time, but it's sort of having to follow the, the information that is given to us because we cannot investigate yeah. further than what the actual sources are telling us. But, but, but the problem that, 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 that was highlighted is you can't tell how many people have died if you're not testing people. Yes. Right? You know, so and, and the problem is because they decided in February they didn't, the, the deputy chief medical officer said mass testing is not appropriate for the UK. Uh, and now today they're trying to do hundred thousand tests every day. Yeah. You, you know, <laughs> completely yeah. changed their mind, but you, you, and, and, and there are all the people dying at home. What, what have they died of? They're not being added into the figures at all. And, and so it, it's becoming a fool's game. Uh, and I think really quite unfair of, of, of journalists to say to the government, you don't know how many people have died. Why won't you tell us the truth about how many people have died? Because nobody knows. And the reason why nobody knows is because there's no mass testing and because there's, the reason why there's no mass testing is because the scientists told the government not to do mass testing three months ago. And so you sort of go around in this kind of vicious circle without getting anywhere. And, you know, again, I, I, I honestly think that the, the, the two things, given that people, as we've all agreed now, accept that the science is a moving target, I really think the things that people want to know more than anything else are, is it safe to go back to work? Is it safe for my children to go back to school? And if they do that, are they going Absolutely. to bring them back into the house? Uh, and and when's the vaccine going to turn up? You know, anything other than that, I think at the moment is just noise. I really do. I think just I just want to add one noise about the vaccine as well. I would I would uh, say because uh, an average vaccine, yeah, an average vaccine takes three to four years, and um, some some uh, sources are saying in September it will be ready and distribution will be early January. I mean, we, we can't say for sure, but that's what they're telling us. No, there's also some, something really else, Ro, actually. Um, if, you, if, you, if I can stay on you for a second, uh, I think there are now two major things that are happening. First, people start asking themselves, was it worth this lockdown? And they start losing... Um, the, the, this feeling of right or wrong. I mean, there are many people going bankrupt, many businesses going bankrupt, many people have no idea of their future, which is terrible. But then another line comes about this vaccine. Maybe if they feel insecure about if this is right or wrong, then they will be insecure about it. You know, there was this anti-vax movement for all the vaccines, which was terrible. Mm -hmm. Me, I have two kids, and for me, this was like, please tell these people to go vaccine. But now if, if there are these voices saying, hey, that's kind of a flu, right? I mean, take a look at the numbers, and there are still numbers, the calculation, the countdown 
is still going on and there will be the numbers to be compared yeah. how many deaths there were and what will happen and how effective was this and how ineffective was this so and my question I is have to have a going to damage immunity. the whole thing i think um and something that we've been doing over um at forbes is really looking to history to kind of answer those questions yeah. Obviously, the coronavirus is something completely new. We haven't seen it before. But even if you look to the Russian flu or the Spanish flu, you know, history does repeat itself. SARS. Um, yeah, SARS. So you can kind of look to history to even be able to ask the right questions when you're reporting on this um, and look to see what they've done. And again, that provides a bigger perspective um, and more context so that you aren't getting this misinformation and you know can really point to it to so like uh journalism is a rough draft of history and you can look to actually new articles that are a little bit eerie to read today about what they were doing with the spanish flu and kind of how that turned out also the, there is no guarantee that this vaccine will work we have the vaccine for flu but people still die of the flu every year so we're we're functioning in an era where this, uh, there's a psychology of fear and um you know It'll take a lot of confidence to get out of it. I think in our case, the, the kind of stories that we generally tend to see uh, do well um, are stories that have a bit of hope in it. Um, so stories with any exit strategies, mm. stories where you uh, mention how the lockdown is going to be lifted. And as Lawrence mentioned, when does your life go back to normal and what is this new normal? Um, does this mean I'm able to take the tube and go back to work um, and pick up my coffee? And will that will that coffee shop will still be open? Um, will that guy still be there with his, uh, you know, with, with coffee and croissant in the morning? Um, and also this whole growing fear of a second wave coming in. Um, mm. And I think that sort of ties in, into the market reaction as well that we see at the moment. We, I mean, I, I cover markets quite a lot. And the, one of the things that we constantly see in terms of worry uh, among investors is, if the markets start to get a bit stable right now and people think, oh, it's all fine, you know, we're all back to work and bye-bye coronavirus. And then a second wave comes around in September and then that's worse than this one because people have actually had enough of lockdown fatigue by then. Um, so I think that's that's another really big thing that to watch out for at this point in time. Yes, I. you gave me a very good reason to ask you the next question, but let me give you some context. I do believe in doing good, right? And I'm sure we all, here like this. That's what we invited you because we saw that you're positive, that you approach that in a positive way. And we have created a number of movements, right? Webit community outreaches to over 800,000 people, all of them Gujarati. So we have launched the, uh, the COVID-19 health uh, security challenge. We've seen over 350 companies applying, truly amazing, with great ideas. We already shared them with the largest corporates. We already shared them with the Commission, with United Nations, and hopefully they will find um, good reasoning to use them. But I'm asking you, as as global top leading journalists, can still news be positive? Can we? Uh, it changed a little bit on the way, right? Uh, first we were saying how many deaths there were. Then we started saying how many uh, healed people are out there, right? One million healed, two million healed. Can we keep, because people at home being desperate between four walls and not too much of information, actually a lot of information and disinformation, can we send positive news and still be accurate? I think we're already sent, sorry. Just Go ahead. I think we're already. I think we're already sending very positive messages, um, uh, and we are trying to balance it out. And my colleagues here uh, on the panel, um, you know, they they're doing exactly the same thing. There are stories of hope, and there are these small stories that bring happiness, bring a smile on your face. I mean, to give you an example, we did a story just last week about this couple in Italy um, that have been separated by lockdown in north and south of Italy, and um, how they managed to keep their relationship going on 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 Zoom and FaceTime, and they read a book every night together they watch they watch the moon outside together um and there are these stories of hope there are stories of people helping out helping each other there are community helps so there are stories definitely out there unfortunately as i mentioned these are times where people tend to look at the negative more than the positive um because we don't have a vaccine we don't have uh, any certainty in terms of how this whole thing is going to be played out the negatives are uh, unfortunately just offsetting the positives I, I think, think it's also journalism. Sorry. sorry, go on, Lawrence. 
Yeah. Well, I was, I was only going to say really briefly, um, you know, it, it, it's, it is clearly not a new story that the vast majority of people recover. But it is also true the vast majority of people recover. And, and when all you see in the newspapers is look at this young man who was fit and healthy and died and this person died and this person died, you, 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 you are going to end up with a, 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 a forgetting that it's still got, kind of got one or two percent mortality and you know or, or even even very often often elderly people who go into hospital actually can, 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 can come out alive and you know, i think it's oddly i think it's quite helpful for the government when it's trying to get people to stay inside when when all you see is this endless sort of news cycle that makes you go blimey i can't all these people dying because if, if you're panicking, you're not going to go out to the shops, are you? You're going to try and stay inside, which is what they want to happen. But I, I don't think what you read in the papers every day is a, is a very accurate picture. Um, but it is, as I said, it is, it is news that the vast majority of people get over it, is it? I have a question because we have to wrap up. And I knew that we can talk for hours. But you are so busy. And we promised you we're going to keep on time. And... Uh, we need to ask at least a couple of questions from audience, or at least one, because we only have like a couple of minutes left. I, I have a, a, I mean, hundreds of questions, but one is from Berlin, from uh, Hans. I'm not going to check now, but uh, Hans from Berlin. How do you see the future of news? What will change and what lessons will be learned from this crisis and the way we manage information during it? Such a fantastic question. I'm. Uh, I would love to hear your your answers. Uh, That's let's start I've actually. The... Oh, sorry. Okay, yes, please. <laughs> this is something I've actually been thinking about quite a bit, and um, I think you know it's easy to see readers as kind of this faceless, you know, mass. But I think what we're seeing actually is you know a lot of critical thinking and um, really developing this acceptance for uncertainty. I've seen that we really don't have to coddle our audiences and they're not going to, I think they're learning not to hold up a piece of news and see it as the gospel truth, um, which I think is, especially in the U.S., pretty important. Um, so I think that might be one good thing to come out of it is that we're developing the sense, this acceptance for uncertainty and that, you know, news is evolving, science is evolving, and it's a process. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Liz. I, I think that gives a, a good insight on where you think is, uh, is it going. Um, I saw Spreaker who wanted to start also answering, or am I um, wrong? No, no, I, I'll, I'll uh, do it very briefly. So I think, I think this is a very fascinating time uh, for news, for journalists, as I mentioned. Um, and the future of news, nobody knows but it, it is very it is very interesting it's a very interesting ride and there are lots of formats that we tend to be you know working with now so you start to see that people are engaging more and readers are engaging more and more with videos with stories with stories that have interactive graphics um so you know as a journalist you suddenly feel like you've become re researchers now um uh, where you're trying to find out various uh, formats for your readers uh, and you know do a mix of stories that are not just text based but visual as well um, and um, I think I think this is this is something that will probably stay on for for years to come. I think. Uh, Thank you so much, Rika. Ruby, please. I think the consumption of news uh, on digital platforms, uh, even though you know it has moved, shifted quite a bit, I think it'll shift even further. I'm working on uh, BBC Voice, uh, which is an artificial intelligence platform where you can uh, where you can speak to your Alexa or your Google and say, "Give me BBC News." Then with that, you know, you don't even have to sit near a, near your phone or your computer you can it, it, it will you just get as soon as you prompt the card it, it, it you get your news bulletin and it's becoming effortless for people to consume the news and uh since the pandemic you know our our customer base is up and people are listening a lot more so i would say that digital is where we're headed how do you go and you trust an algorithm yesterday no the day before uh, we've been with um, Roger Ver. Not sure if uh, if you know Roger. He's the Bitcoin.com. He's the first comer into the Bitcoin business. He's been self-financing most of all crypto startups out there on the market. And uh, I've asked him a question. I was together with him and with the chief editor of Coin Telegraph. 
uh, Christina, and, and I said, all right, are you ready to get into an autonomous car just <laughs> without a wheel, without anything, no oh. driving wheel, you just get in there and drive. Are you ready? What about you? How much you trust the algorithms? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I think we have a bit of a way to go with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, by the way, the problem, the, 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 the interesting thing about the media at the moment, just really, really, really briefly, is you're seeing news channels get massive audiences. Everybody's watching news, and yet advertising's gone through the floor because, because all the companies being shut down. And I think news channels, which are reliant on advertising, are going to be in some trouble uh, in, in a few months' time. And it's the same with the newspapers uh, in, in, in this country as well. It's, it's, it's a very strange juxtaposition at the moment. What an amazing transformation. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting what you say. So you expect that after this crisis, the news channels and all news that, that account on advertising are going to suffer the same challenges that the printed media had before the, the digital. Is that what you say, Laura? I think, I think, I think they're going to have to start. That, well, my general prediction when this ends is there's going to be another at least 10 years of austerity uh, in Western countries because all the governments have just thrown as much money as they possibly can uh, at trying to stop people from going to death or whatever. Um, it's all going to have to get paid back. You know, then they're not going to write it all off. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of the people who are being bailed out at the moment uh, are going to go through the same sort of austerity probably as they did before. And that's also true, obviously, for, uh, for the media as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we have really to wrap up. And I have a, a request for you, maybe no more than a minute per person. Wrap up that situation and shine a light. Tell, tell the, our thousands of people now online, we've picked to set certain moment. Um, how do you see the information? Because it's, information is key for making decisions. It's about is my, my kid going to study in university or he, it will be a, a homeschooler? Is my uh, wealth going to disappear or is it going? It's all about critical thinking and we so much count on, on reliable media like Business Insider, like BBC, like Al Jazeera, like Forbes. I mean, we start our days with, with you guys. So what is, what is the light you can shine? What, what is your horizon and how do you see that crisis impacting hopefully in a positive way our lives so i think First question um, i could ask um i i think i'll start and i'll just say that this is one moment that has brought the entire world together um, frankly each one of us is exactly in the same boat um and we're all sailing through um and I know that it's very uncertain. The times are really, really uncertain, and we don't know what way we're going to be headed and how long we're going, we are in this for. But the fact remains that we are all in this together. Um, and this has also brought in a massive sense of responsibility among journalists, which was always there. But you know, to be able to be told that you know you're actually leading um, a, a leading voice in these challenging times is a really, really big sense of responsibility for journalists. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can just say that we are all in this together. Thanks so much. Liz? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and again, I think we all appreciate our audiences bearing with us and riding through this wave of uncertainty. Like I said in the beginning, we're not out on the front lines of this in the way healthcare workers are, but we're really trying to help navigate, like I said, this infodemic we're all dealing with. And I think it's great to see audiences really having critical thinking, looking for context, looking for reliable sources, and developing an acceptance for uncertainty. I think that's an interesting um, and great move. Thank you so much, Liz. Ru? But audiences now are probably more keen than ever, and especially younger audiences who do engage uh, on social media. Um, and I think that uh, there is a, um, I think that the audiences are also much more conscientious than, so uh, the younger, the, the younger generation is much more conscientious about wanting to make positive changes, be it with climate change or 
um, uh, any kind of uh, altruism. I think it's it's more part of the mainstream now to be responsible for our environment. And uh, this has been testament to that because, okay, mm -hmm. granted, not every, there are some people who are flouting the sort of uh, uh, the rules and they are out. But overall, I would say that it has brought us together and everyone, it's, it's about, it's about under, it's created more of an understanding and I think a more of a sort of unity. And uh, I think that it's a good place to restart from, shall we say. A good start to restart. A good mm -hmm. place to restart. That's mm -hmm. that's a good start for start. And Lawrence? No, I think so too. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, as I said, everybody wants to think, it, it, wouldn't it be great if something good came out of this, you know? Um, and, and, and we see fewer planes in the sky, we see, we see less pollution, you know, we see cleaner rivers and whales having a nice time in the sea and all this sort of thing. And a lot of people are saying it's, it's, it's a test run for how, how to combat global warming. And I, I think, you know, g given that the science is messy, as we've all been saying, and we don't know what's going to happen over the next few months, what about if we start saying to our leaders around the world, why don't you start acting together as a group of people? Uh, and think about how, when we do come out of this, um, you, you you know you you, you you make it a fairer and better place for, for everybody living here. I mean, that would be the best thing to happen, wouldn't it? Is if it's a reset button. Discussion. Uh, thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, it was eye-opening. It was um, something that. I think we owe to the people because at the end of the day um, we all rely on you that's why the media is the power and we will keep on inviting and hopefully you promise us you join us again and again in the next weeks uh, when we shall be shedding light on um, different opportunities you follow technology and we are all believers I'm sure that technology uh, might have brought us to some places, but it will, it could take us to a much better places if we use technology for the sake of the human mind and create the desirable future together. I'm grateful for all of you being with us. Thank you so much for joining. I would like just to say thank you to all of you who joined this program. We had uh, people from over 130 countries, 134 countries registered for this particular program. We've reached over 7,000 people watching it live and like look forward to share it with uh, hundreds of thousands from all around the world. I apologize for the fact I couldn't ask all the questions, but I've learned my own lessons because we had four phenomenal journalists with uh, obviously with um, a wonderful way to express their beautiful minds. And um, I didn't dare to to um, stop them, etc. But it was a great show. I've learned so much. So thank you all for joining. Looking forward to see you next week when we start the Webit Virtual uh, Committed Weeks. Next week is, uh, is the week of mobile innovation. We shall be seeing um, uh, some great people as part of, of our thought leadership programs. Guy Kawasaki is joining us. We have uh, Adam uh, Cheer, the founder of City. Uh, we have uh, people from different telecoms. Toby Recho, the senior vice president, Vodafone, uh, sorry, uh, Verizon, so, sorry, Toby, uh, senior vice president, Verizon, responsible for 5G. Uh, Karim Lesina from AT&T, uh, truly phenomenal leaders in mobile innovation. You will hear some great stories and opportunities which rely, of course, to the exit of this crisis. We shall be having one full day of um, of startup pitches, mobile innovation startup pitches with um, investors and hopefully some live real life deals, and we shall have the usual media panel at the end of the week with reflection again and uh, with with ideas of where we're heading next. Our community has grown from the past week to this week with over thirty five thousand people who added their emails to our database, who registered and subscribed. That's Phenomenal. I'm so grateful for, on behalf of the whole Webby team. We promise you that we shall be with you, not only during the COVID crisis, but together on building that desirable future together. Thank you all for being with us and see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.
This program is powered by the virtual.show, making your offline events virtual.